welcome to the Shining Light Podcast. This is Pastor Sam. And Patrick, no compromise with Evil Wyatt. And today we're going to continue our discussion on dispensationalism. We have gone quite a few dispensations now. We're almost yeah. to the end, the second to last one. Okay. Uh, and so we've gone over innocence, conscience, government, promise, and law. Law was our last one, and, and I think we've got to talk a little bit about law. We were just talking before we came on that to, to get into our next dispensation is, of course, grace. Um, there has to be a little bit of a review. Maybe this is the first time you've watched a podcast. Um, hopefully you've watched all the dispensations all the way through. This would make perfect sense if you would, as much as sense as, I, <laughs> as you can get out of me. You can certainly get more out of him on dispensation. Yeah, some people say that I'm stinky. <laughs> That's not me. Oh, I'm oh you, sense, not sense. 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 Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know how you're going to recover from that one. I sense a disturbance in the force. <laughs> but uh, so, so there's a, when we talk about grace, and, and we'll be talking about dispensation in a minute, we're going we're gonna to do a little bit of review on law mm-hmm. because the law where we left off in the last dispensation, we're pretty much dead in the water. We're to a point where we really need some grace at this point is in history where man has failed God over and over again. Mm-hmm. Now he's failed the law. What do you do next? Right, yeah. Yeah, we, we look at this here. God has been administering his rules. He administered them, as we said, through innocence, through conscience, through promise, through, uh, I, I skip government. I always do that. Government, promise, law, and now he's going to, about to administer his rule through grace, which is, is something that we want to remind you of, is that dispensationalism, it's not a new way of salvation. It, it's, it's not necessarily a length of time, though it fits within a time frame. Mm-hmm. But what a dispensation is, is it is just an administration of God's rule. God says, here, I'm going to go and give you this tool for you to obey me. And the question is, is will man obey God? And so far, how's man done through the uh, first five dispensations? Well, the very fact that we're two for, through five dispensations means there's been five failures. Whenever there's a need for a new dispensation, it means, okay, you, you failed that test too. Here's something else I got, and I'm going to give you another chance to be obedient. So uh, in this particular case we just failed law and now we're going to have to he's going to administer grace to us now and brother do we need grace that's right and in some of these uh these ruling factors they they hold over from the other dispensations uh what are some of those ruling factors that hold over from the dispensations well conscience is still there we still have that conscience and especially Mm -hmm. as a christian we have that conscience of the holy spirit so uh, you'd have a Christian would have the Holy Spirit restraint within them. Now a person that's not saved doesn't have that because they don't have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We still have government. Government's established for order and and uh, in rightful government it should be to protect the innocent and to punish wickedness. And uh, we have promises. God's made promises. Some of His promises He's made. Some of His covenants have been unconditional. In other words, those are going to extend forth no matter what we do. Now some were conditional. If you mm-hmm. do this, I'll do this. If you do that, this is what I'm going to do. And then, of course, we have the law. God gave us the law, put it down in written form, the Mosaic law. Um, and in the greater knowledge uh, uh, that encompasses from time beginning to time in is God's moral laws, which define what is sin and what isn't sin. So we have all these things to help us to understand how we can be obedient and how we can avoid rebelling against God and, and against His nature. Right, and, and we're no longer under that, that idea of this, this the ceremonial law. We can eat... Uh, shellfish and shrimp and things like that. You I corner, mean, trim the corners of your beard. Do you do that once in a while? Okay. Uh, you, well, you know what I've seen you do though is <laughs> eat a lot of shrimp. <laughs> I, you I, knew where I was going with that, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> I, I do like the all-you-can-eat shrimp specials. I try to make it well worth my time. I, you know. I, I thought I was going to challenge Patrick to a shrimp eating contest, and and you know I, I was telling him how many shrimp I could eat, and he's like, "Well, that, that's good, you know." And, and and I was like, "Well, how many can you eat?" And it was like literally four times as much as what I'd ever eaten in one <laughs> sitting. I'm like going, "Yeah, I don't, I, I don't really feel like being that sick, so we're not going to do that." But and we did not want to contribute to the more gluttony than what I normally would do in an all-you-can-eat yeah. situation. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's that's a sin I'm working on in my life is, is gluttony, and that's thank, for sure. Thank God he's given me some grace. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but but grace is the new ruling factor here, and uh, I, I want us to read Romans 6.14. Uh, do you got that, Patrick, there, Romans 6.14? I do. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law but under grace. Oh, man, there it is. We're not under law anymore. 
But under grace. That, that's what people say. We're, we're, we're not under law. Okay, we oh, can boy. go and we can do what we want. Let's go party. Let's go have an antinomian party and, and, and do the, the lawless thing, right? There's a lot of heretical doctrines that are, folk, or that are bouncing around out there based on, on misinterpreting and misconstruing this passage right here. That we're no longer under law, meaning therefore there's no longer sin for a Christian. We're under grace. I'm free, and hyper grace is one thing that I, I don't know if we've talked about that yet. Hyper grace is a concept where all sin, past, future, and present, has been forgiven. We don't have to worry about sin anymore. Sin's not necessary. Don't even get upset about it in your life. Just live a merry, happy life. Go to heaven afterwards. And if you're sinning, it's already forgiven. Don't worry about it. That is not right. Because no. And so you know, normally we, we've been hitting on the. Uh the misconceptions of dispensationalism from the other side that people would point at dispensationalists. This is one that I would say is within the dispensational camp that mm -hmm. they go and they say, we're not under law. Let's go do what we want. Woohoo! That, That's a sinful attitude that, in and of itself. Right. Well, and, I want to really go sin. And now that I can, boy, am I going to do it. Right. And that's not understanding dispensationalism at all. That's not what dispensationalism oh. is about. That, 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 that is just antinomian garbage right there. Or antinomian barf, as, as, as a friend of mine likes to say. I think I know that friend. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but for, for sin, it, it says here, for sin shall not have dominion over you. The whole point of being not under the law, but now under grace is not so that sin might abound, but it's that sin might be held back. And it sounds like if you're wanting to go out and sin now because of this passage, it still has sway over you that that's still your master. Right. And, and, and we need to understand this here. The dispensation of grace is not that God comes and says, well, can't beat them. I guess I'll join them. That's not what God's saying. He's not sitting here saying, okay, we, we tried conscience. We tried innocence. We tried promise. We tried grace. Or excuse me, we tried government. We tried, uh, we, we tried law. None of those things worked. So I guess we'll just try sin. <laughs> I'm just gonna, and that's the way the world is. Well, if you can't lick them, join them. Right, and that, that's that's not at all what what God is saying. In fact, let, let me explain this here a little bit better through Titus chapter two, verses eleven and twelve. Now it says this: For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Now that's normally what we think of uh, when it comes to grace, but then it continues on in verse twelve, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Now remember. Dispensationalism is not a new way of salvation. It's the same way of salvation. It's just trying to get us to obey God in his standard. And so when we say the dispensation of grace, we're going to get into this in much more detail here in a little bit. We're not talking about a new way of salvation. All of a sudden, God decided to save people by grace. Nope, it's always been by grace through faith. Now what God is saying is, is that through grace, we can learn not to sin. Sin teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. That's what this grace is now doing. It's teaching us how to not sin. Well, Paul says also in, in, in Romans that, uh, shall we continue to sin that grace may abound the more? God forbid. Right. Certainly not. Right? Yeah, yeah. No way. That's not what we want to do. Well, that'd be great. I I mean, the more I sin, God could be more graceful to me. How good is that? That's not what Paul was saying. So no. he's, and he knew that this would be the way it would be taken. That, it would, that something like this, if you wanted to read one one verse, of course, back then he wasn't speaking in verses. If you want to read one sentence, I mean, that, that came later when we actually started numbering mm -hmm. and calling it verses. So he, he wanted to clarify that. So there is greater clarification in Romans over this. So those that would try to teach you that the hyper grace idea that basically there's no longer sin for a Christian is, is not right. Repentance is called for throughout the Bible. Uh, we were talking about this right before this podcast, that whether it would be Paul or whether it be John or Peter, even Jesus in Revelation mm -hmm. is calling for repentance. When they were talking, these letters were often written to Christian groups or churches or individuals that were also believers. These were written to believers. So when these calls for repentance were coming forth, because they're talking about in your church, there are people doing things that even the Gentiles don't do. Or the or right. the unbelievers, the unsaved, the uncircumcised. There are things that in the church that even these people aren't doing. So now what's he talking about? He's differentiating between the unsaved and the church, and he's calling the church, the saved, to repent mm -hmm. of their wickedness. Now, for you to repent, there still must be some law to repent from, right? Some sin. You're saved, 
but you're still in violation of God's character when you do these sins, and there's a recall for repentance. That proves that the law, the moral law of God, is still in effect, even though we live under grace, not under the physical penalties that the Mosaic law would put upon us, which we talked about in the last podcast. For instance, if I do this, maybe I'd be worthy of death, and I should be put to death by the civil authority. Okay, we're not under that anymore. Grace says, no, we don't have that earthly penalty right now. Although man's statutes can have that. You murder somebody, you can be put to death for it. Okay, We live under grace, but we're still under man's statutes as well. We still have to abide, abide by man's laws. Right. And if you have been enjoying what you've been listening to so far on the Shining Light Podcast, you can check out our website at theshininglightministries.com. Once again, that's theshininglightministries.com. You can find all sorts of resources there. We've got articles, we've got other podcasts, and we've we've got some uh, different things in our store also to get. And, you know, we've got all kinds of stuff now on dispensationalism, so go ahead and check that out there. Uh, but oh, you can also follow our, our podcast on podcast platforms like iTunes and Google Podcast by looking at The Shining Light Podcast. Once again, that's The Shining Light Podcast. Check that out, and you can also find us on SoundCloud through Gatekeepers Podcast. Once again, that's the Gatekeepers Podcast. And our website, one more time, is theshininglightministries.com. The Shining Light Ministries. But today we've been looking at dispensationalism, we've been looking at the dispensation of grace, and it's important before we move into how man is going to fail this dispensation, because man always fails the dispensations. And that We are at is, least consistent in that area. Right, we're consistent. And that is that the dispensation of grace is abused by men like Andy Stanley, who goes and says that we should unhinge ourselves from the Old Testament. That is not what the dispensation of grace is about. It's not about a new way of salvation. It's not about going and making uh, parts of Scripture void, but rather what it is about is administering God's rule by saying, because God has done this for me, it's my rightful response to live for Him. Yes, that's our fair and reasonable service. Right, as the Apostle Paul puts it in Romans 12, right? That's exactly right. And... uh, um, but but anyway, uh, as a, a new dispensation, it always comes with new revelation. And uh, the new revelation, I was a little bit vague here, uh, but but I'll go ahead and, and ask Patrick, do you, <laughs> do you see there, w- w- what is the new revelation that we got? Well, the new revelation would be the New Testament. So um, right. the, the teaching, of course, the Gospels, that, those are new revelations. And then moving forward through the Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, and in the, the letters of Paul, and you have uh, the half-brothers of Jesus, James and Jude. You have John, you have Peter. Um, yeah, that's we have the New Testament to tell us of this, this age of grace that we live under, or this, this time of grace. Right, and it's not quite the entirety of the New Testament, because you have, you know, Revelation 19, I think, is when it, it, it goes and starts talking about the, the new heavens and new earth, but also the millennial reign and different things like that. That will be under God's kingdom or Christ's kingdom. And that's that, that's a different dispensation, but, you know, it's basically the whole New Testament. Yeah, yeah, other than, and of course, it, it, when we get into that part of the revelation, and we're talking about, obviously, again, man has failed, and mm-hmm. this is the, the final punishment of the failure. Right, right. Final and so that's... Uh, that, that's, that is what we need to look at, but we need to understand there, it's basically the entirety of the New Testament, uh, except for a few passages here and there. Um, but the, the whole idea here of grace, of course, it, to break it down to, to three different groups, I, I broke this down a little bit different than most. The first group there is the unsaved. How should the unsaved uh, respond to God's grace? Really, there's only one choice for the unsaved, and that's to accept salvation by believing in Jesus Christ, repenting of their sins. You know, we talked about law. Understanding that under the law, under sin, you you have sinned, right. and that the penalty for sin in every instance is separation from God and eternity in hell or the lake of fire after mm-hmm. that. Um, so if you don't do that, I mean, your fate is sealed. You're either going to be saved. Ultimately, there's two types of people. There's saved and there's unsaved. Right. Absolutely. And th- that's the idea that the unsaved should accept God's salvation, just as Patrick was talking about. You only got one choice there. Uh, now, to the church, though, um, th- this this new revelation that we find in the New Testament, it talks quite a bit to the church here, what should we do? And there's several things uh, there. One is, is fulfill the Great Commission. Now, what's the Great Commission, Patrick? To go forth and make disciples of all nations, teaching as Jesus had taught them. 
So right. to make disciples, obviously somebody has to be saved first, but saved is not the extent of making a disciple. That's the first step. Now they are ready to be discipled, meaning to um, a master as Jesus was, would teach his disciples how to become more like him. So to grow in your faith, to become sanctified, to mature in your faith, to make you better able to be an example to others, to be more bold in what you say, more knowledgeable to help people continue to grow in their lives. So we're to part of, part of making disciples, of course, is preaching the gospel, getting people saved, but it's much more than that. It's it's a continual process of exhorting, edifying, holding up, supporting, counseling, crying with if that's what we're doing having joy with Paul Paul was a great example of this mm -hmm. going through the, through the Bible and it's interesting too that the second example is the church we're talking about the body of the church as Christians is, is more of a collective um, group of people right it is a, is a group of people right and, and, and that kind of leads into that next idea there of uh, to maintain a pure church membership mm -hmm. uh, now that we, we're well we're not perfect on that we we know that we'll see that uh, in the rejection here, or not the rejection, but in the uh, failure. But the goal is to to have the church be the church, to not have it have non-believers, but to have it to be believers. Well, the point there, too, is a great point you just brought up. Church is for who? Believers. Okay, so churches that are geared towards non-believers, towards this, the seeker-friendly church or that sort of thing, then that means the whole message, everything is destroyed watered down to attract that sort of person in there. Mm -hmm. Now, should an unbeliever come to church? Absolutely, but they come with the expectation, I hope, of seeing the truth and being saved. But church is primarily for the believer and also for the unbeliever who's seeking the truth. Right, and that's that's why I believe it's important to preach the gospel. Uh, and In fact, you, you'd be hard-pressed to find a sermon where I don't go and, and at least make a presentation of the gospel. But the whole church service, it's designed to be edifying to the believer. I like to say E&E, &E, the idea of edification and evangelism, but it's the idea of we never lose any edification to seek evangelism. Making and, disciples right there, right? Right. That's that's the purpose. Um, also, uh, to discipline unruly members um, of the church, once again, uh, we see this in the, the New Revelation, uh, in the New Testament here. Um, yeah, it'd, be, it'd probably be really good to do a podcast on church discipline sometime. You don't really don't see that anymore, not at all. No, not that it's not needed, but right. it's just it's overlooked because well the standards have been dropped so low now. Right, right. Uh, and then of course the church ought also ought to prevent false teaching, which of course that means preaching the truth and exposing false teachers. Yeah, showing where they're wrong and here's scriptural basis for it, and don't listen to it. Right, and and along with that, contend earnestly for the true faith. Uh, then you have believers. Now, this is the individuals yeah. here. And now, we're part of the collective, too, as individuals. All that stuff's right. on us still, right. but as individuals, we have also responsibilities. Right, and I would say that these are really, uh, if you're going to accomplish the church thing uh, as a collective group, it takes individuals doing their part, doing these individual things. And what are some of those things, Patrick? Well, live godly lives. I mean, how, how can you lead others if you're not living a godly life? If right. you're not being obedient to God, how can you tell somebody else to be obedient to God? You can't. You lead by example, right? That's right. what you should. Um, you should be associated with a local church. Now, that can be difficult. Not every church, and I would dare say most churches in your area, are not obedient to God's Word. There's a lot of apostasy. Mm -hmm. This is part of the great falling away. But be diligent. You can find a church. Don't say it's too hard because it's well worth your time. Even if you have to drive a little farther, it is right. well worth your time rather than going to a dead church or a church that teaches falsely. Right. Well, I can't remember, was it um, Oswald Chambers, maybe, who said something to the effect of, uh, or maybe not Oswald Chambers, maybe it was A.W. Tozer, who said, uh, we ought to find the church that is closest to the Bible, not closest to our house. Yes, that was Tozer. Yeah, that's a great quote. I love that guy. The more I read him, the more I like him. Um so, yeah, so find a local church or, and, and be active in the church. Don't just sit mm -hmm. in a pew. Your pastor needs your support, especially if he's doing the right thing. And if he's doing the wrong thing, maybe you need your help or maybe you need a new pastor, but you at least have to put that forth. Pew sitting is not a gift. <laughs> and then, of course, as individuals, we're to spread the gospel because guess what? Most of the people that we know that are unsaved don't go to church. So they're not going to get it from your pastor or somebody else's pastor if you don't tell it to them who will. Right. And the, the last one there is to fulfill the Great Commission through discipling others, which is basically done through all of those things collectively. 
And of course, the responsibility and the test of man is, would they obey God? Would they do those things on the basis of conscience, Holy Spirit's restraining of evil, uh, government promise, the moral law, of course, and now grace? Would they do it? <laughs> And what, what do you think, Patrick? You are in the middle of this dispensation. I mean, you might be towards the end of the dispensation. I'm not sure when this dispensation is going to end, but, but it's still going on right now. Well, I saw in the Bible, I've seen at least the end of this dispensation. And so the final call there is uh, no. In fact, we will become so wicked on this earth that God will have to step in and finally put an end to wickedness. So mm -hmm. we, we are failing. And in fact, if you turn on your TV, look at the newspaper, even talk or see what's going on in society, you can tell that we are failing miserably. Right. The, the majority of the unsaved will not accept salvation. Now, I know that gets a lot of people rallied up when you say that, but the reality of it is Jesus said it before me, so I'm just echoing Jesus' words. Take it up with him, not me. He said, narrow is the way that leads to life. Few there find it. Broad is the path that leads to destruction, and many travel it, right? And Pastor Sam is saying won't. He's not saying can't because everybody right. has that choice. There's right. a big difference between those words won't and can't. Right. That's, that's, a, huge, there, there's, that's a huge thing right there. Uh, but the majority of the unsaved will not accept salvation. They will reject God's grace, which has is, is come full circle. It is fully revealed to mankind right now. It, it's no longer veiled in just simply promises. It's no longer veiled in, in even the shadow of the Mosaic law, which was a, of the greater things to come or the old covenant versus the new covenant. It's not veiled in those things anymore. We see the grace of God perfectly today. And yet, man will reject it, most of man. Also, uh, the church is going to mess up too. What are some things that they're not going to do? Well, the things that we just talked about that they should do, the church is not doing. They're not always going to keep a pure membership. They're not always going to properly discipline church members. And by that, like, if you know that there's a, a couple living together coming to your church, and they're living in sin, and you're sitting there and you're acting like it's just no big deal, you're doing a disservice to your church, and you're doing a disservice to that couple. Absolutely. So, so that's just an example. They don't always prevent false teaching. In fact, sad to say, many churches actually advocate and openly preach false teaching. The false teaching in the church today is not so much coming from the outside, although that's, that's where it ultimately, originally came from, and that's where some of the money that pushes it. It's within the church. Mm -hmm. And you have people that claim to be pastors that aren't. They're, they are willfully deceiving people towards hell. And we're not contending for the faith. So obviously, if we're allowing false teaching, we are not contending for the faith. We don't. Even, we will not even speak up in words some of the wickedness of society. Say against abortion. How many churches has never? If, if you've been to a church, maybe you're going to one now. You've never heard a word about abortion, whether it's right, wrong, or indifferent, or, or homosexuality, um, gay marriage, um, adultery. How many people talk about? How about fornication? Because. It's more than likely, out of all the people going to your church, if there's a sexual sin being committed, it's not the homosexuals. They don't comprise very much of the population. Our society pretty much just accepts carte blanche, and it's okay to be sleeping with whoever you want to. Of course, we're not sleeping. Right. And, and so the church is going to fail. The individuals are also going to fail in all those areas that we pointed out. And this is going to bring some judgment. And uh, the judgment is sometimes God brings premature death for ungodly lifestyles. Now, this is an interesting one, uh, but we see this in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 when it talks about communion. And it says that uh, essentially uh, that because some people took communion in an unworthy manner that they are asleep. That's talking about that they died. Yeah. Uh, you think of Ananias and Sapphira. That was what just popped in my yeah. head. Yeah. For lying and holding back keep for greed for keeping part of a, a money that said they were going to give to God. Now, could they have kept some of that money back? They could have had they not in the first place said, well, I'm going to give it all to God. When you're lying mm -hmm. to God, that's a problem. You don't lie to God like that. Right. Now, I'm not trying to say that everybody who dies prematurely, I'm not trying to say uh, that everybody who dies in an unnatural way, although death technically isn't natural, uh, <laughs> It is a, it is a it, I'm not saying that it's because of sin. I'm just saying that some of these people, it is because of sin. We see that in Ananias and Sapphira. We see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Uh, we, we see this uh, throughout the New Testament. And, and this is a big thing to understand because this is serious. We, we kind of look at this and we're like, whoa, God's kind of mean there in, that, in, in the Bible. That, that must have still been the Old Testament God. Well, the Old Testament God and the New Testament God are the same God. Yeah, just different dispensations, <laughs> as we've been talking about. 
Right. He's just administering his rule different. He's not making a standard different. Uh, another divine judgment here is that God can put churches out of existence if they don't run properly. And God will go and shut down different churches at different times or allow them to be shut down. Uh, you know, I think of this example, and it's, it's alluded to in Revelation, uh, to the, the churches specifically in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, when he says that he will put out their, their lamp or, or their, their mm-hmm. light. Yeah. I'll put out your lamp, you know, your candle. Mm-hmm. And uh, the now it, we don't have time to get into those seven churches today. That, that'll be fun though to, to do that. We are going to do that. Yeah, but that that doesn't mean either though that that it, every church that shuts down is because uh, they were they were running properly. And every church is flourishing is because God is blessing them. That's not the case at all. In Revelation, he does talk about those who I love, I chasten, chasten and rebuke. So mm-hmm. sometimes that chastening and rebuking churches love, there's some good that can come out of it shutting a church down. Some of these big apostate churches, shutting them down wouldn't do anything. They would pop back up again. The really scary thing is if God's not chastening those that are teaching falsely, maybe that's because they're so far gone it's not going to do any good. Right. It's because they're not sheep. It's because they're goats. And that's the uh, that's the problem. As Spurgeon said, there will come a time when when uh, we'll no longer have shepherds feeding the sheep, but we'll have uh, clowns entertaining the goats. And we've got an awful lot of clowns out there today. And a lot of happy goats. <laughs> yep. Yep. Well, well, this is the dispensation of grace. And of course, I, I think it's important for us to really hit back on that idea that this is not talking about a new way of salvation. This isn't talking uh, about a uh, license to sin. But rather, this is talking about God administering his rule. He is saying, now that you can see the full grace of God, now that it, it's no longer hidden, it's no longer veiled, now that you can see it, here's the thing, I'm showing it to you, and you ought to live for me because of this. That, that's the reasonable thing to do. When God has done something so amazing for us, we ought to live for him. Any, any other thoughts on that? No, that's a good summary right there. Yeah. And this is, this is important to understand that contrast of law and grace. You, they're, don't, they're not fighting each other. They're not sitting there butting heads. In fact, without law, there is no grace. There's no need for grace. Right. And, and this is important to understand. God's way of living is the most gracious way of living. God doesn't say, hey, don't go and have multiple sexual partners because I'm mean and I don't want you to have fun. He no. knows what's best for us. His standard is what's best. Yep. Wickedness is never good for you. No matter how good right. it may feel in the moment, it always has consequences that are far worse than what you thought you were going to pay. Right. Sin is always much higher priced than what you first anticipate. Mm-hmm. Well, that's all I got. You got anything else? I think I'm Patrick No Compromise with Sin, Wyatt, now. Okay. Well, it's the same thing as evil sin. Yeah. I, I can get behind that. <laughs> Uh, For the Shining Light Podcast, this is Pastor Sam. And Patrick, no compromise with Sin Wyatt. Have a great day.